turn on your Wi-Fi. Don't connect to anything. If it connects automatically, just let it. But don't connect to anything. I'm gonna first if it's already on, on, should we turn it off? <laughs> yeah, if it's on, turn it off, turn it back on. Restart it, why not? So here's, here's what we're doing. And, and I kind of want to start about one of the fascinating things about Wi-Fi before I talk about the RF side and the wireless side and all that. And this is, always, this is always fun to do in front of an audience because it catches a lot of people off guard if you've never seen it before. And so everybody's got their Wi-Fi turned on? All right, cool. So what's happening right now? There we go. There's a couple, a couple, two, three more. Is Do you see your name up here? Who's uh, Jason? Jason has an iPhone. Jason has an iPhone. Uh, Carissa? Carissa's got an iPhone in the back. Uh, Penelope? Omo? Yeah. That's one of my devices. These Android devices, those, if you look at your MAC address, you'll see that that's your MAC address. <laughs> what we're doing is something that shows off the very basic reason why understanding how wireless works is absolutely imperative. It's absolutely essential for you to understand how this works because of what, what I'm doing right here. What I'm doing right here is what's called uh, a man in the middle attack. And essentially what I'm doing, in, and we're gonna learn about all this over the next hour, you know, I've got like a thousand slides. So what we're doing is we're intercepting your Wi-Fi signals and we're mimicking a Wi-Fi access point so that you think I am who you want me to be. So the, the way to explain that is if you look at this, this is a list of the people that are currently connected to my service that think that they're connected to someone else's service. And what service do they think that they're connected to? We'll take a look real quick. They think they're connected to, this device I'm using is a $100 device. Someone thinks they're connected to AT&T Wi-Fi. Someone else thinks they're connected to STC Setup, Lowe's Guest Wi-Fi. AT&T Wi-Fi, Best Buy, Hilton Honors, McAllen Public Wi-Fi. This is who your phone or your device thinks that you're connected to. And because I've been able to trick it, now I sit in the middle and I can launch all kinds of different attacks. I can grab all your data, I can see everything you're doing, I can strip your SSL headers, I can grab your cookies, I can pretend to be you. So it's pretty fascinating. And it only took a second. All you had to do was turn on your Wi-Fi. You didn't connect, you didn't have to connect, it connected for you. And we'll talk about how all that works. But anyway, I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. It's always a a fun way to start is showing something off like this. Here's, here's all of the, the networks that it's seen over the last you know 30 minutes or so. Let's see here. I'm just going to take probe requests and remove the duplicates. Let's see, we've got AT&T Wi-Fi, MCA2, McAllen Incubator, WBU Setup. Um, where's a fun one? EduRoam, Castiel, Jaguar, Ruby, Hilton Honors. Any of these sound familiar? So these are the networks that you might have at home, or you might have at school, or you might have somewhere in there. <laughs> Own it, brother. Own it. So the name of my network is Bob Esponja, because I'm a sponge and I'm sucking everything up. And I live in a pineapple under the sea. So I'm going to turn this off. It's called for a million dollars, I'll sell you one. It's called a Wi-Fi pineapple. Are you going to raffle that off? Hell no. <laughs> I'm going to raffle off some free web design, dog. Booyah. All right, let me connect real quick, and then I'll get on board. Let's see here. So my name is Drew, and I'm from the Valley. I'm a wireless network engineer. I started my career down here a bunch of years ago, 20 years ago or so, maybe more. Um, building some of the first dial-up internet service providers in the area. And ever since I did that, I've been fascinated with connectivity. How people get online, uh, what they can do to get online, whether it's dial-up or DSL or ISDN or wireless. And about 20 years, or about 15 years ago, my career took a turn into the wireless side. And so my background's in data networking, data fabric, routing and switching, you know, big data transport, OC3s, DSLs, you know, or OC12, whatever it is. And uh, I shifted over to wireless, and when I started messing with wireless, I learned that there was a lot more to wireless than what I was trying to do with it. And you know, 10 years ago or so, it wasn't normal to have a data nerd and a wireless nerd in the same person. You had your, your wireless guys and you had your data guys, and the two should never meet, ever. And if you ever went to a police department, you knew that, because at a police department, there was the guy who handled the, the two-way radio and the guy who handled the data, and they never, ever, ever got along. 
And so as things grew in the industry and wireless started becoming more prevalent with Wi-Fi and you know, cell phones and LTE and you know, 4G and 5G services, people really started to rely on that, on that data guy. But that data guy now had to understand the concepts of wireless. And so instead of trying to figure out how it all worked, uh, I, I went back to the, to the original guys that, that really nerded out with this. And I got my amateur radio, my ham license, um, so I could operate ram, amateur radio. So I could learn very specifically how wireless worked. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. This is yours. I got to sign into my own. Um, and so what I want to talk about is the basic fundamental understanding of RF. Do you know what RF stands for? Radio frequency. Super cool. Okay, so there's going to be some of you guys in here, I have the feeling, that are going to know more than, that's not my deal, um, that are going to know more than others. And that's cool, but we're, going to, we're taking this down to a very, very basic level. And that way we all get the same, the same understanding. I'm not lying, I really do have like 65 slides, so I'm trying to hurry up and get this thing loaded. They're all like one, one deal slides though, like they've got one picture on them or something. All right. Now, usually what I do is in the top right-hand corner, I put little goofy-ass hashtags and everything. And it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and so I didn't finish hashtagging the rest of my slides. But I usually have a good time doing that. So give me one second. And put the load up. Google don't fail me now, right? Wireless 101. Yay! All right. So this is, again, this is meant to be an absolute basic entry-level uh, approach into wireless. And what we're going to talk about is going to span everything from what wireless is to how you put data on top of it. But first, Hedy Lamar. <laughs> Hedy Lamar. Anyone? Yes! Ding, ding. Good job. Have you ever seen Blazing Saddles? It's Hedley. Never mind. Bad joke. Hedy Lamar actually invented frequency hopping spread spectrum radio communication services. And it's a really cool story that you can look up on Wikipedia. You just got my attention. Good. The basic, <laughs> the basic principle here is that they have these things called torpedoes in World War II that were going off to attack, you know, boats and whatnot. And she said, hey, man, if all the torpedoes are using the same frequency, then it would be real easy to jam that frequency and thereby jam the tor torpedo, tortillo, jam the torpedo uh, and not allow it to be effective. So what they did is they said, well, what if we have a group of frequencies, 88 frequencies? And it went from one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. And we synchronized the radio on the, on the torpedo and the radio on the ship so that that way the two could communicate. Hey, Slazzy, what's up? <laughs> so that way the two could communicate without having to worry about inter interference or interception of those signals. And you know what they used? What has 88 different things in a row? A piano. A piano. So they used a, a little machine from an old player piano that would pick the frequency that it used. And that's how a frequency hopping spread spectrum was born which is now what we adapted into CDMA and TDCDMA, which is used on your phones, which is now LTE. So thank you, Hedy Lamar. Did they did. <laughs> that's, the, that's the non glamorous part. The Navy was like, you're dumb. You're just an actress, you know, who married Mr. Mayor from Metro Golden Mayor, whatever his name was. And they blew her off until Vietnam. And they're like, whoa, this thing actually works. So it's pretty fascinating. She sold the patents to a company called YLAN in Canada. And uh, they're still around. So, Hedy Lamar, everyone. It's Headley. Blazing Saddles. No. Go ahead. I don't know. No. My thing is not online. I try to keep my <laughs> thing off. <online. laughs> Jesus, woman. <laughs> Your PowerPoint presentation. That's what you want to call it. My PowerPoint. <laughs> I'll share it out. Do you want to like re play along at home or? Oh, no. <laughs> well, I can share it out. <laughs> You're blushing. <laughs> can you see it okay? All right. First, first things first. Pop quiz, hot shot. Let's get a few things straight. What's this? You're exactly what I was hoping to be here. That is not an antenna. That is a tower. The blue things point to antennas. The red thing points to a tower. It's a communications tower. Cool. What's this? A router. Very good. It's not an access point. And those are antennas on a router. Very important to know. These are access points. Access points and routers are different. Routers have 
entirely different things that they use. So just from a terminology perspective, I want to make sure we get a couple things out of the way. Um, that's the matrix. Bits and bytes, right? How do you describe, when you call up Time Warner Cable or whatever, and you order uh, a pipe to your house, like you order, you know, you order cable service, what do you judge that by? What's the scale that you judge it by? You have X amount of, and that's referred to as broadband, but what's it refer, like the flow of it is bandwidth. Okay, so common misconception, right? Bandwidth is how wide it is. Throughput is what it goes across. So if you order a 50 meg pipe, it's got the bandwidth or the capacity to use 50 meg, but you're actually going after the throughput. You want 50 megs of throughput. So bandwidth versus throughput. I, I mix and match them all the time, but from an RF perspective, when you start talking to RF nerds, they get very, very picky of when you say bandwidth. They start talking in megahertz, and you go, no, I want like 10 gig, and they're like, well, how many megahertz do you want? So very important. So RF is pretty simple to explain if you've ever slapped a puddle, or if you've ever thrown a rock into a stream or into a pond, that creates waves. And those waves uh, are, are essentially the same thing as radio waves, moving all throughout you know, the spectrum of, of the air that we can't see. There's a couple things that are used to define uh, what those waves, or define how those waves look and how they act. The first is if you, if you drop a, you know, if you drop a rock into water and you see the waves go across, when we talk about amplitude, we talk about how tall that wave is, the size of the ripple, how high up does it go. And wavelength is the distance between the peak of each of those waves. So your wavelength is between those two and your amplitude is how far it goes. Your frequency is how often those waves come through. So if you're standing at a point and there's a bunch of waves and that wave is hitting you over and over again, that's the frequency. That's how many, how many waves are hitting you per second, per, you know, per minute, per hour, whatever it is. Pretty clear. I'm telling you, this is 101. So we're, we're starting at the very bottom. So amplitude, wavelength, and frequency. We good? So on the surface of the water, that amplitude is the top side of the wave. The bottom part of it, the null, doesn't matter. You don't count anything in the null. All you're worried about is, is what goes up. Now, how wide that wave is, that's what your wavelength is. That's, that wavelength determines your frequency, depending upon your wavelength. Got it? We too deep already? <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's talk about hertz, megahertz, and gigahertz, and my head hurts. Not a car rental service, but this is cycles per second. A hertz is a cycle per second. So when you talk about one hertz, that's one cycle per second. A kilohertz is 1,000 hertz, 1,000 cycles per second. Megahertz are a million, gigahertz are a billion hertz per second. Does that make sense? If you ever heard the terminology, 2.4 gigahertz, Wi-Fi operates at 2.4 gigahertz. That's 2.4 billion cycles per second, per second. So when you think about that wave, that's 2.4 billion of those per second. Does that make sense? All right. Here we go. We're having fun. The top of each one of those waves carries data. And you start to stack on what are called bits per hertz. How many bits per hertz can you get on a radio wave? So when the wave goes up, it gives you a 1. And when it goes down, it gives you a 0. Pretty cool, right? Computer programmers and whatnot. 1s and zeros rule the world. So that's how it works. It goes up, it goes down. It goes up, it goes down. It goes on, it goes off. And you can modulate that in different ways, which we'll talk about in a second. So in the clear signal, you get 1 if you're, if you're modulating the amplitude, right? How tall it is, how, how loud it is. If it's really loud, it's a 1. If it's really quiet, it's a 0. 1, 0, 1, 0. Bap, bap, bap. Cool? All right, each peak carries data. You get a certain amount of bits per hertz. So this is pretty fascinating. This is where you start to, to tie it into Wi-Fi and how you get 54 megabit per second. If you've ever wondered when you, when you connect your wireless connection, it says you have, you know, your, your, your speed is, you know, 200 megabits per second or, you know, 50 megabits per second. That all has to do with how many bits per hertz you can stack on top of it. In the old days with 802.11a and b and then 802.11g, you could get 2.7 bits per hertz on there. And this is the, the maximum per hertz, right? As of right now, you know, we're researching this. 3.61 bits per hertz with 802.11n, right? Everyone adapted to 802.11n. All our new devices have it. Now you can get another, another bit, almost bit and a half on top of that. But 802.11ac, the new stuff that's out on your iPhones and your Macs and whatnot, that's going to give you 5.4 bits per hertz. So what does that mean? If you're processing 2 billion bits per second, 2 billion hertz per second, and you're stacking this on top of there, now you start to look at how many bits you can move per second on that radio wave. Does that make sense? Yeah? Kind of. Okay. All right. All right. So let's talk about radio waves. 
so this is this is the spectrum, right? And as you go up in frequency, the waves get closer and closer and closer together. Because in the same amount of time, your frequency is going to determine how many of those peaks hit you every second, every minute, and whatnot. So the lower the frequency, does that mean that you're going to have more hit you or less hit you? Less, that's right, because it's lower frequency. It's a much longer wave. So you're only going to get you know, 10 in the same amount of time that if you were up a little bit higher, you would get a lot more in that short amount of time. And so to give you an idea about the, the relation of the size of these waves, I thought that this was pretty, school, pretty cool. So radio waves, when you're talking like 100 megahertz, like you hear on the dial 88.1 and 107.9 and 94.5, those are all in, your, in, in the, those are kilohertz, right? No, those are in, in the kilohertz side. So if you look at those, those would be about the size of a tall building, Empire State Building, in relation to these other guys. As you start to move on and you look at microwave, like the stuff we use on our cell phones, 700 megahertz, and when you look at, uh, when you start to look at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, you get down the size of humans, then down the size of butterflies. When you look at the infrared spectrum, TV remotes and whatnot, in this same scale, that's a needle compared to the Empire State Building. So these, these waves are completely different in size as they move throughout the spectrum. Now, that whole inverse correlation of the higher you go in frequency, or the, the lower you go in frequency, the longer the waves get, that comes into play when we start talking about why Wi-Fi works the way that it works. We good? It's fun. It's a little different. A little different. So, size matters. 2.4 gig, 4.9 inches. Uh, 5 gig, 5.7 gig, 2 inches. That's the size of the wave from one to the other. If you think about that right now, a 2.4 gig wave coming off your phone for Wi-Fi is 4 inches long. It's about that long. <laughs> 4 inches is like that long, right? You know what I'm saying? Anyway. anyway. So, <laughs> so, 4, 5 inches, about that long is what the wave is from peak to peak. So coming out of this phone, you have all these waves and they're flying you know, past our heads right now as they're going into these different access points that are around here. And as you start to move up in frequency, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's interesting, if you've ever tried to use the 5 gig service, 802.11n or 802.11ac on your phone, you notice that the coverage area is a lot smaller because those waves are a lot smaller. They're more susceptible to interference. They're more susceptible to free space loss, which is something we'll talk about in a second. If you start talking about 60 gigahertz, which is the next iteration of, of super Wi-Fi, it's 802.11at, I believe. It's what they're trying to pass a standard for so that like your Blu-ray player can connect to your TV without having any wires and have to plug in a cable. That's in the 60 gigahertz space. Those waves are 0 0.0196 from peak to peak. They're super, super small. So you can imagine that's not going to cover a whole huge area. It's not going to cover the size of your living room. The difference between analog signals and digital signals, if you don't know this, this is very simple. Analog signals are nice and round and smooth. Digital signals are on or off. They're either up and they're down. An analog signal, while you can vary uh, different amounts of amplitude and the size of these uh, so that you can do amplitude modulation on them, so that you can modulate it based on your amplitude, high and low and whatnot, you can do that there. On digital signal, again, it's on or off. You have a specific amount of spectrum that you work with, and it's either working or it's not. A great way to explain this is uh, old school television. When you're flipping through the channels or when you're turning on the radio and you hear the radio station come in and go out and then go away, as you tune it closer, the signal gets stronger because you're getting closer to the main lobe, to the main peak of that. With Sirius XM or with Direct TV, when your picture screws up, it's just a bunch of blocks and it stops. That's the difference between digital and analog. It's either working or it's not working. My question is along the lines of musicians. Why do musicians prefer analog signal over digital? Ah, good call. So it's a much warmer sound, right? It's a lot warmer because it gives you more play. It's not either, you know, high or lower, on or off. It gives you this like a glow, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah, it has a timbre and color to it. A lot of musicians tend to go towards analog boards or analog systems because of just the pure tones you'll get out of it because it's not so harsh. Digitally, you can tell, in yep. a digital recording, it'll either be silent or it'll have some like sort of crackle. sound. In an analog, you'll have more of a crackle or a warmth to it. It'll sound more natural to the ear. It, if you have to kind of train yourself to listen for it, but that a lot of musicians will pay good money for it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. Fantastic. And again, you know, we're talking about radio waves. So these are radio waves. These are, this is sound, this is vision, this is light, this is microwave. These are all radio waves. They're just at different ends of the spectrum. 
Li-Fi is something different. Li-Fi li is, a, is, a, is a new adaptation, and what they're doing is they take a light bulb and they turn it on and off very, very quickly so that it's invisible to the human eye. You can't tell that they're turning it on and off, but you have a receiver that's so sensitive that it can see that it's on or it's off, or it's on or it's off. And basically, it's transmitting ones and zeros as it's on and off, and that's how it's replacing it. But it's doing it so fast that it's able to transmit a huge amount of data. The downside is that once you cover up the light and you don't have a light source, the data connection is cut off. It's pretty fascinating. I saw I saw Li-Fi demo. So back to this, when uh, to, to go over a couple different, you know, more of the of the the names here. Your channel bandwidth is how wide your channel is. And we talk about different channels, 107.9, you know, 102.1, all these different deals are channels. And you talk about how wide your channel is within this within the spectrum. And the spectrum ranges. You know, we talk about 2.4 gigahertz. And what does that mean? That means that it operates at, at 2,400 megahertz. And that's the frequency of the waves that are coming by. It's, it's 2,400 megahertz per second that fly by there. So that's what that frequency is in relation to. And in that 2,400 megahertz, you have different channel sizes that take up a certain amount of that channel. So within your 2,400, you have maybe 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz. I'll show you a better example of it right now. But the way that it looks across your frequency from low to high is your channel bandwidth is how wide that channel is. It's very important to understand how wide that channel is, and I'll talk about why in just a second. In different uh, types of frequencies, you have, this might be 2400, and this might be 2450, which means you have 50 megahertz of space. From one end to the other, you've got 50 megahertz of bandwidth. Does that make sense? 2400 to 2450? Inside that range, you might have three 10 megahertz channels. So that there's 10 megahertz, 10 megahertz, and 10 megahertz. Does that make sense? Imagine like a, a road with three cars, and the road is 50 megahertz wide, and each car is 10 megahertz wide driving down the lane. Is that, is that a pretty cool way to explain it? So you have those channels, and each one of those channels can carry a certain amount of data. So in 2.4, 2.4 gig Wi-Fi, the stuff that everyone has that's on their phones, you have 14 different channels. 11 of which are in use in the United States. In those 11 channels, there are only three what are referred to as non-overlapping channels. Because what happens when you have two overlapping channels? What would happen if there were two radio stations broadcasting right next to each other on the same frequency or on a frequency that's right adjacent to it? You won't be able to hear it. The same thing happens down here all the time on old radio. You got a lot of bleed over from Mexico because it's right there, but they're operating on the same frequency. So one goes in, one goes out, determining on who the stronger transmitter is. And so when you're working with data, you try and keep it as discrete as possible. You try and only use as much as you can. And so in 2.4, you only have three non-overlapping 20 megahertz channels. Follow me? So <laughs> from 2400 to 2460, there's three 20 megahertz channels. Got it? 60 megahertz wide divided into three sections. Now. 2.4 gig, that the spectrum that's used for Wi-Fi, they doubled that. They said, hey, you know what we can do is what happens if we bond two of those channels together and we create two 40 megahertz channels. So now you can transmit more or less data. More data. More data in the same amount of, of space, right? So everyone's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Well, what do you end up with? You know, when you have all these overlapping channels and you try and take a big chunk out of here, and let's say I have an access point in here at 40 megahertz, and there's an access point downstairs at 40 megahertz, and there's another one over there at 40 megahertz. You end up with wireless networks completely covering each other. Because in the 2.4 gig space, with only three non-overlapping channels, everyone's fighting for those same channels. How many people have used Wi-Fi in here? If you set up an access point, what channel do you put it on? 1, 6, or 11, right? You either go 1, 6, or 11, because that's what you're supposed to do. Channel 1, channel 6, channel 11, because everyone's contending for those three same channels. And that creates an issue, because that creates interference. And with interference comes a, a bad link quality. With bad link quality, you can't pass as much traffic through. Your signal sucks, your throughput sucks, all because you only have those three channels to work with. So how do you solve that? In the United States, this is the frequency allocation chart set up by the FCC. And it starts, you know, way down here, super low, you know, in a, God, I don't even know what the lowest one is. To, two megahertz or something, and it shoots all the way up to radio satellite telescopes. Out of all of this frequency, you hear people you know, online talk about the frequency crunch and how we're running out of frequency and we're running out of space. Think about why they say that. If there's only three non-overlapping channels in all of the United States and everyone has Wi-Fi at their house and at their business and in their car and on their cell phone, 
if there's only three channels that everyone in the US is supposed to use, it's not going to work. It's never going to work. You have to figure out a way that people can share that medium so that they can you know, make the most of it. These frequencies that you use on your cell phones, these are licensed frequencies, and they carve it up into very specific little chunks so that we can have a better communication on here. But in unlicensed communications, in 2, 4, and 5 gig, and Wi-Fi, you're, part, you're FCC part 15. You're susceptible to interference. Any device that you have has to be able to receive interference, and it transmits interference. So that's interfering with that, with that, with everything else. So across the whole US, you have these three channels, these three stinking channels that we're supposed to use to do all this crazy technology. And out of all of the spectrum that's available in the United States, this is what Wi-Fi looks like. 2.4 gig is right there. 5 gig is right there. And that's only because this little section right here just got given to us last year. So there's all this spectrum out there that carriers are holding on to, that the government's holding on to, that all these people are holding on to, and they're not using it for anything. It's up there taking up space that could be used to further data communications. Go for like, are they holding on to it like from defense, or like is there a specific reason? Are they just being greedy, or are they just being government bureaucrats? There's a, there's a lot of red tape involved in some of it. They, well, we might need it someday. It's hoarding. I mean, what it comes down to, it's like, it's like hoarding. They're hoarding all the spectrum because, man, this, think about where we are as a society and, and our use of wireless technology. Do we use wireless for everything, right? And it's only going to get worse. We're only going to use it more and more and more. So whoever is holding on, let's see, where are we at here? This is the 5 gig spectrum right here. Check this out. Whoever owns this portion of it, they're sitting there going, that's money in the bank because someone's going to pay for that someday because they're going to need it. And the guys that are on this side, money in the bank. You want to see how much money? One tiny sliver of the 700 megahertz spectrum just got auctioned off for $77 billion for 10 megahertz of spectrum. 10 megahertz. It's nothing. It's 10, you don't even see it on 10 megahertz. This wide. T-Mobile. <laughs> but T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon. No, I mean, who owns all the spectrum? Who, who's auctioning it off? The FCC. They give you the approval to broadcast on on their frequencies hence pirate radio anyway <laughs> the whole the whole different subject but that's kind of that's where we are at as a nation so what happened now, was how, how do other countries let's say mexico they same thing they have a group called gofetel that ma that maintains their spectrum and their their communications for them so it's the same deal if you have a if you have something that you're trying to transmit on and it's not on, on an approved transmitter like if i set up a transmitter on top of this building like Joe, the radio station guy down there, 97.7 you know, megahertz, that's his, his call, 97.7, that's his call sign. If he was broadcasting off of here, and I owned a radio station that was 97.7, and I owned it, the FCC had licensed me for it, I would complain to the FCC, they would send someone out with a signal finder, and they would find out where he's broadcasting, and they'd get the crap out of it. Yeah. So that's, that's how that works. Fear and intimidation. Yeah, your government. <laughs> so... So, so back, to, back to what we were talking about. So then in the 2.4 space, this is all we were working with, and no one ever thought Wi-Fi was going to amount to anything. You know, you asked a question earlier, what does Wi-Fi stand for? It was kind of a tongue-in-cheek. They named it Wi-Fi for wireless fidelity. If you're old enough to remember what high fidelity was on speakers, that meant that you had a great stereo system. So they named it Wi-Fi. It's like, oh, this would be cool, and then it took, and everyone liked it. And no one understands what Wi-Fi, what the hell is wireless fidelity? But it's the name of it. You know what I mean? It's pretty fascinating. So as it started to gain in popularity, they started to open up more spectrum. This is called the UniBand and the ISM band. Uh, it's for, for science and mechanical. Uh, it's, it's for, you know, it was set aside specifically for use of, of development of science and technology in the United States. That would, that's what the FCC said. This chunk, no one's ever going to use it. We'll give it to the scientists. Well, sure enough, everyone started to end up using it. So now we've started to develop this 5 gig space. How does this affect you, right? The laptop that you're on and the old cell phone that you have would only ever operate on 2.4 gig. It was a, a Wi-Fi device, a 2.4 Wi-Fi device. The access point that's in here is, is an 802.11ac device. It's the most current device. 802.11ac doesn't use 2.4. It only uses the 5 gig spectrum. Why? Anyone? No? Why, why do they choose the 5 gig spectrum over the 2 gig spectrum? Bandwidth. Bandwidth is the key. So in the uni bands and in 802.11a and in, in the 5 gig space, each one of these blocks is a 20 meg is a, I believe this is a 10 megahertz channel. No, it's a 20 megahertz channel. Each one of these little pyramids is a 20 megahertz channel. When we talk about 2.4, you've got 60 megahertz worth of bandwidth, right? Follow me? It's carved up into how many non-overlapping channels? 
Do you remember it? Three slides ago? Three. Three non-overlapping channels. Look what you have in the five gig space. The same size channel, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty-one non-overlapping channels in the five gig space. That's exciting. Then you can say, oh, well, that's great. Now we can use more. Now we can have more devices co-locate. We have more access points. We have more of everything operating in the five gig space. Something just to point out right here, whether radar takes up from 116 to 132, and there's, there's something called DFS that's enabled on radios. Uh, it takes up actually from 52 all the way to 144. These are the channel numbers. Um, DFS is dynamic frequency sharing. What it does is if it notices that there's a weather radar that's trying to transmit on that channel, it shuts down communications for 20 seconds and then it pulls it until that radar is done broadcasting so it doesn't interfere with weather radar. Step Y. So if you ever have a radio and you start to tune it over here into, I believe it's like 5400, like, uh, like 5500 megahertz, sometimes it'll turn off on you a bunch of times because if, especially if you live close to an airport, it'll notice that weather radar and it'll shut itself down. So be wary. Anyway, back to this. 20 megahertz a channel. So what happens? Just like happened in 2.4, in 5 gig, they said, what if we bond two of them together and now we create 40 megahertz channels? So now you've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 non-overlapping 40 megahertz channels. Let's think about the ripples and the frequency. If I'm putting, you know, three bits on top of every bump, on top of everything that comes up, right? And I've got now... 40 billion of those every second as opposed to 20 billion. Now I've doubled my capacity. So with 802.11n, the new standard, now they're stacking more bits on top of it. So you can, you can go from you know, a 6 to 8 megabit per second connection to a 20 megabit to a 50 to 100 megabit connection, depending on how they modulate it. We'll talk about modulation in a second. Following me? Makes sense, right? Bigger channel, more capacity, more bandwidth. So. Then the FCC decided they're going to open up lower uni one. Yay! Super awesome. Because now everyone was doing 5 gig. As soon as they opened it up, Apple started putting 5 gig chipsets in here and in here and there. And there's 5 gig chipsets everywhere. And they went, oh, shit, guys, you know what? These, these overlapping channels aren't enough. We need more. We need more. They went to government. They said, government, we need more. We can't possibly take, you know, we can't do this without having more. So the government said, we're going to open up an additional about 100 megahertz worth of spectrum in the lower 5.1 gigs. So we got real excited. That's great. You know why they did that? 802.11 AC. If we went from 20 megahertz channels to 40 megahertz channels, what do you think came next? 80 megahertz channels. And then down into 160 megahertz channels. But what does this do to the spectrum? You went from having 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 non-overlapping to 4 to 2 to 1 non-overlapping channel. But at 160 megahertz, think about it. If this up here is 20 billion times, 20 billion bytes, 20 billion times that wave is going to hit you every second. This is 160 billion times that wave is going to hit you every second. So now you get more and more and more data. Does that start to explain data rates and, and Wi-Fi and whatnot for you? Pretty fascinating. So to go back to it, you you know you've got the 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 blocks over here are 20 and 40 megahertz. People are getting away from 2.4. They're saying, you know what? Leave those on garage door openers. Leave those for smart grid. Leave those for the little nest appliances. Leave them for stuff that takes up very little capacity and move over to the stuff that uses big capacity. My cell phone, your cell phone. Move those over into the 5 gig space so that we can use more. Cool? I think we're like halfway done. So, <laughs> so let's go through in a single channel. One channel. In 2.4 gig, how many non-overlapping channels are there? Remember, 60 megahertz of spectrum, three non-overlapping channels, right? So in that channel, in the single 20 megahertz channel, you can stack 2.7 bits per hertz. 2.7 bits on every time that wave goes up. Boom, 2.7, 2.7. Simple math tells you that 20 times 2.7, close enough. Gives you 54 megabits per second. If you remember, that was the old standard. Man, I can do 54 megabits per second. 802.11 in came along, 3.6 bits per hertz, 40 megahertz channel, 140 megabit per second. That's how it translates, back and forth. This isn't a single channel. We'll, we'll start to talk about modulation now. 802.11 AC, first wave, wave one comes out with 5.4 bits per hertz in an 80 megahertz channel, right? That one right there, 5.4 bits per hertz. That's going to net you about 432 megabit per second. You drop down into 802.11 AC wave two, which is just now finally getting some daylight. 
Again, 160 megahertz channel, huge channel size, 864 megabit per second. This is how we're able to get gigabit speeds is because we're increasing the size of this channel. Now, it's not only about increasing the size of the channel, it's about pushing more bits and bytes on, onto each one of those, you know, each one of those uh, waves that comes up. So, go ahead. So, 166 megabytes, right? Mm -hmm. If, obviously, that's big. That's by weight a little bit. So, if you divide that by 8, how much, how much is the output? By 8? Yeah, because that, that's, uh, that's almost in megabytes per second, right? This is in megabits per second. Yeah. Yeah, and so you would multiply it times 8. So, divide by 2. You multiply this times 8 to get how many megabytes per second? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah bits to bytes. Is that the AC 2200 designation? No, well, uh, we're going to get to that in just a second. That, that's where I'm going next. Pretty fast. Are you guys following? I mean, is this like super duper boring or it's pretty boring? Yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. Boring. We're going down. <laughs> we're, says the guy drinking beer. We're going. So we're going to start to get down the rabbit hole a little bit. Hang on. Hang on to this one because now it starts to get weird. This, yeah, this is where it gets, this is where it gets weird. So. In a standard radio communication conversation, how many antennas are on this thing? One. One, right? So I can send and receive off of this one antenna. And if I'm communicating with another device that's just like this and it has one antenna, then I have a single input and a single output, right? One in, one out, SISO. One in, one out. Well, actually, one out, one in. <laughs> Transmit, receive. Now, they started to say, well, what if we can take this and then we stick another antenna on here? And now we have two antennas on a radio. And those two antennas are communicating with one radio. Multiple antennas out, single antenna in. My son, right? <laughs> or SIMO, if you do it backwards. Single out, or single in, multiple out. So when they started screwing with this antenna technology, this is where this guy comes up. How do you say it? You guys know the correct pronunciation? MIMO. It's not MIMO, it's MIMO. This is MIMO. So, in, well, it depends on how you no, pronounce things, I guess. So, MIMO is multiple in, multiple out. If I can carry, let's say, one megabit per second on a single deal, and now I've got two feeding two, now I can carry two megabit per second, right? Or I can carry, that would be two megabit per second. But if I've got two going to two, how many is that? I've got four megabit per second using the same transmitter. Let me interrupt for a second. Anybody not get pizza? Everybody's cool. Man, we ran real low today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so does that make sense? With a single one antenna, one in and one out, you've got one megabit per second. This would be two going to one. This would be one going to two, and this would be four. So because you're using multiple transmitters and multiple receivers with multiple antennas, now you can start to do that. And what's really started to, to take hold is you have different types of not only antenna configurations, but something referred to as spatial streams. And so if you've ever seen the nomenclature like this on something 4x4, four four, you know, by 1 or 4x4x4 four 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 or whatever it is on a box, what this refers to is this is one single spatial stream. It's one stream of data coming in and one stream of data going out using four transmitters and four receivers. 4x4x1. Four by four by Four in, four out, one spatial stream. If you have four by four by two, now what you can do is you can pump multiple data streams in there. So this might be a 10 megabit data stream, this might be a 10 megabit data stream. And then across this guy, these radios can now communicate at 64 megabit per second inside here, but still kick out those two data streams. So now you can start to stack more data streams on it. What are like antennas usually made of? Copper wiring or gold? copper wire, good old fashioned, <laughs> good old fashioned copper, man. Um, and then wrapped in some type of, you know, BBC or some type of, you know, whatever yeah. covers up. Are they like pioneering like antenna design anymore? Because oh they yeah, the they, they are. Have, like, really awkward shapes, and that yeah. because of, uh, I think it's like fractal geometry. I almost brought one tonight, but I didn't really think anyone would give a shit, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, they still are. They, they, uh, there's a company. I'm real good friends with the with the owner of it. It's called MP Antenna, and they're in Cleveland. And they make the reason they're called MP Antenna is they make multipolarized antennas. But that's not as important, you know, in polarization. And I didn't put a slide in here about mm -hmm. antennas, but it's very basic to understand. 
In antennas, you have a polarization. It's here polarized vertically or polarized horizontally. It's either up or it's down. It's shooting out the waves like this, or it's shooting out the waves like a snake. Does that make sense? Multipolarized or dual polarized is when it's doing both at the same time. If you have one transmitter connected shooting out vertical and one shooting out horizontal on one frequency, and then you have these two on another frequency, now you're taking advantage of what's called spatial diversity, and you're taking advantage of multiple polarizations, multipolarization. Does that make sense? So think about, you know, I, I don't want to go down this far, but I will for just a second. If you think about it, if you have a communication link that can communicate at 10 megabit per second from one end to the other, and you take that same one and you're broadcasting it vertically, and now you broadcast it horizontally, now you've doubled that throughput. Now you can get 10 on one vertical and 10 on horizontal. And if you combine that with two different uh, 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 MIMO devices on there, now you can effectively quadruple that. Huge. Yes, it does. And your throughput as well. Because your bandwidth gets bigger. You can punch more stuff through there. Can you get it, can you get it like a star almost? Or it's not only We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> so the antennas on the router do matter? Yes, dude, yes. I mean, that's a I mean, that's one of my favorite things to see is that, you know, someone will have this, you know, they'll be like, sing off on the edge. Like, Man, my signal sucks. And they go on their phone. Oh, my signal's great. It's like, hey, bro, check this out. It's pointed this way. And now your phone's pointed this way. There's no signal, signal mismatch taking place. So these were built horizontal and vertically, uh, horizontally and vertically because look at this laptop. It's supposed to be at a 90 degree angle. When my computer's sitting on the ground, it's not sitting at some strange angle. When you mount an antenna on a roof, how often have you driven down by the police department and see their antennas mounted at an angle? No, man, they're all, they're all plumb. So that's, the, that's it's part of the reason I sell some of the equipment that I do is ruckus, the, and you guys have seen you know, some of the gear, like the gear that's in here, it does something called transmit beamforming and adaptive beamforming, which will, I can talk about that later, but basically what it does is it has uh, 14 different antenna elements inside there, and it uses different power and different element, elements to create a signal or a beam that's specifically to design to how best you will receive it so that it can increase the, the capacity that you have and give you as, a, as much bandwidth as it can so it can give you as much throughput as it can. It's fascinating stuff, but yes, the answer is yes. They're still working on that stuff. Uh, uh, in continuation with the antenna thing, you know, last you mentioned, you know, the tap, uh, like uh, the laptop, right? You know, so it's right there, the antenna is running alongside like, mm -hmm. the thing, right? What happened to, for example, you know the Mac Mini? You know, yeah. Computer? You, know, you, you know how it has the Apple logo in the front? Uh -huh. Actually, how many? Uh -huh. uh, that, uh, my understanding is that that is like a transparency iron kind of a thing. Yeah. That's how it gets the thing because it's a full aluminum body. Let me show take it out. No, no, no. I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. But, uh, and that's, there's an omnidirectional there, antenna built into there. So is that like, is it building inside or what? Uh, let, me, let me come back to you and talk to you about yeah, that yeah. after. But Later, yeah. yeah. So, so to go back to this, because I mean, we were pretty deep in, into the MIMO conversation, mm -hmm. right? It gets, it gets kind of weird here. So here's how it affects it, right? Four by four. Four transmitters, four receivers, one spatial stream. Four by four by two, four transmitters, four receivers, two spatial streams. And what does that mean as far as capacity? So in a, we talked about channel sizes, right? In a 20 megahertz channel on 802.11n with one spatial stream, you can push 75 megabits per second. With two spatial streams, it doubles. With three spatial streams, uh, it triples, right? So as you increase the channel size, if you go from 20 megahertz to 40 megahertz, now it doubles in this direction because now you don't only have 20, now you have 40. And you take it over to 80 and then to 160. You've got a huge channel size with a whole bunch of spatial streams going on at the same time. Three spatial streams in 160 uh, megahertz. That's how you get 2.6 gig or one point, where you talk about the, the 1.3 and 2.3 for AC. That's how they're doing it. Multiple stra spatial streams in large channel sizes. Now, <laughs> where it's going with 802.11 AC Wave 2 is here. This is Quantina. This is a company called Quantina. They were first to do 10 gig over the air. So 10 gigabits per second in capacity over the air using 8x8 MIMO with 8 spatial streams. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, it's a whole bunch of, you know, super nerdy. So now that you have that, and I'm going to talk about interference in a second. Now that you have that, then they come around and they introduce this thing called Moomimo, 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 Moomimo. Multiple user, multiple in, multiple out. And so with 802.11 AC Wave 2, what you have 
is you have a single user using four spatial streams, right? You know, whole, or using uh, four by four, getting a whole bunch of data to them, or taking that same chipset and branching it off. Instead of doing four by four, you have two users doing two by two. Does that make sense? Pretty simple, right? Oh, no. Well, instead of using all four, instead of giving you, you know, all four, I'm going to give you two and you two at the same time. And so 802.11ac wave 2 allows you to do that. So now you have the ability to serve a lot, the same amount of users with a higher amount of capacity or more users with a slimmed down amount of capacity. So in 802.11ac, I don't even know if I said that right. In 802.11ac, you can serve uh, more users better is what it comes down to. So when people talk about the upgrades and about where they're going and why they have this equipment and that equipment, the reason that they go after a new one is specifically a lot of people have been holding off on 802.11ac wave 1 that just came out because now wave 2 is coming out and you can serve all these users with all this crazy stuff. To give you an idea of what wave 2 gives you over wave 1, your, your, your data rate on 802.11ac wave 1 is 1.3 gig per second. On wave 2 it starts here because you've got three spatial streams. You can crank up to four spatial streams in 80 megahertz. 3 in 160 or 4 in 160, and now you can effectively do 3.5 gigabytes per gigabits per second using just wireless. So there's an article that was published in Network World yesterday that said, is the day of wiring your network over? Has wireless, does 802.11ac wave 2 finally replace wired networks? So it's pretty fascinating to understand. If it's about the speed, you don't need, you don't need a wire. This entire facility in here has one wire, and it's what connects the wireless network to the wired network. Everything in this entire building is wireless. But really, like, when you get more speed, you reduce range, though, right? Uh, I was reading an article. We'll get into that. Yeah, that's like, that's slide 2,349. It's coming up. <laughs> Nokia, was it Nokia that came up with 5G already, like, theoretically? Well, the, that's, that's all a naming thing, man. You know what's crazy about that is 5G. It was like, 5G. It's not really 5G. It's, it's 5 gigahertz. They're talking about 5 gigahertz. They're talking about the move to 5 gigahertz. They're calling 5G 5 gigahertz. And you're like, dude, what? If so from the industry perspective, you're like, dude, seriously? I mean, you're, it's a naming thing for them. It's ridiculous. But the reason that they're doing it is something called LTE, uh, LAA, L LAA LTE or LTEU. And essentially what that does is it uses, you know, on your little phone, it says 4G or LTE. So the new, the new hotness is the freaking carriers. I, People in the wireless industry, industry tend to not like the carriers because they eat up all the spectrum and they don't leave anything for anyone else to use and they pay trillions of dollars for it and then they don't do anything with it and then they charge you absurd rates for your cell phone service. So it's a lot of people in the wireless industry like really there's a very, there's a very big love-hate relationship there. And so what they did is if you go back to this thing, this thing right here, um, if this is 5 gig, this is 3 gig. This is, this is 2.4. The carriers live right here, like more or less. They have a pretty big chunk of spectrum over here, all right? But they've, they've used it all up because everyone their mom has a cell phone, so they've used all of that spectrum up. So they're trying to figure out how to deliver you better service, faster service. You know, kudos to them, right? So they developed this thing called uh, LTE, LA, or LA, LT, or LTEU, that's what everyone calls it. Ericsson, the engineers over at Ericsson and Alcatel Lucent got together and they said, hey man, you know what's real badass? What's real badass is there's five uh, gigahertz spectrum over here that all these other guys are using for like unlicensed crap, but they're putting it on all their on all their access points. So let's leverage that. So at LTEU and T-Mobile is the first one in the nation that's announced they're going to do it. at and is coming by. I love how Eric knows everything I'm talking about. By the way, this is great. This is one of my really good friends. So, um, so what they did is they said, well, dude, you know what we'll do is we'll use the 700 megahertz frequency that we use for LTE, and instead of doing your download and your upload. We'll send all of the, the clicks and, and commands on 700 megahertz in the, you know, in the finite amount of, amount of spectrum that we have, but all the downloads, we're going to shoot that crap across 5 gig because we've got these huge channels that we can use. So anytime you click to go, go to CNN.com, the request is going to go up on 700 megahertz and it's going to come down on 5 gig. So you're about to see a huge capacity increase in what your phones can do because now they're taking advantage of that. The good thing is it's built into a lot of phones already. If your phone is, has an 802.11ac chipset, you're already using five gig. The chip is already in there. They just have to figure out. It's one of your newer phones. 
So it's fascinating that they're doing that. However, what these freaking carriers have done now is they've taken this awesome spectrum that we've been loving for so long with 802.11ac and woo, all this great stuff, and now the carriers have moved in and interloped on the things that we're doing. So it's like, damn it, dude, seriously? Like, you don't have enough out there? So now we've got less spectrum for us to use to, to develop, you know, applications and to drive business and to do all these other things. And they're still going to charge you for it. They're going to charge you for using your free spectrum. It's fascinating. Anyway. But that's how they're going to do it, LTEU. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. So one of the things that, that you see in here that I haven't talked about yet, we talked about data rates, we talked about spatial streams and channel width and, and MIMO and MUMIMO and MUMIMO and whatnot, 802.11a, n, and c. We didn't talk about this thing in the middle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go real quick through it for the people that care uh, because it, it's weird. So QAM uh, and modulation. We're going to talk about modulation. So modulation... Uh, I, I copy pasted the Wikipedia thing on there. Uh, modulation is a process of varying one or more properties of a periodic waveform uh, called the carrier signal with a modulating signal that typically contains information to be transmitted. A easy way to think about it. This is your modulator. This is your modulator signal right here. It's going low, it's going high, it's going low, it's getting louder, it's getting softer. Your carriers are still the same. Your carriers are what they're going across. But on your radio, you have AM and you have FM. Have you ever wondered what it stands for? Amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. Those are the two things that you modulate. Amplitude modulation is yellow in here and green on there. That's pretty cool. What, what that is, is it's, it's changing the amplitude. It's modulating on top of the amplitude. So it's getting louder and softer. And every time it gets louder, it's transmitting bytes, or it's transmitting bits per hertz. And every time it gets quiet, it's transmitting nothing. So it's one... When it's high and zero and so, so it's going one, zero, one, zero. Does that make sense? So that's amplitude modulation, getting louder, the signal varying via amplitude, making the, when you splash the water, making those waves higher, making the waves lower. Frequency modulation is varying the amount of waves that come across in that same amount of time. So you have a lot that are coming across and then, or, you know, you only have like two or three and then you have like six at a time. And you have two or three and then six at a time. And by doing that, and by setting up a type of modulation, what you can do is that's where you interpret when the ones and zeros are coming across. So when it's a big, when, there, when there's a lot of space in between the, the, the frequency, or when there's a lot of space in between each one of the waves, that's a, that's a null, it's a zero. But when there's a little bit of space, then it's a one. Does that make sense? More or less? So, quadrature amplitude modulation. <laughs> I figured I'd talk about QAM in case anyone was interested. What QAM does is QAM varies. That's not a good slide. This is a good slide. QAM varies two different uh, th two different things, um, but it's actually four because you're doing one on each side. So that's why it's quadrature. But uh, basically, it varies two different properties at the same time to give you a different response. And one of those properties is the angle. If zero is right in the middle, like picture you're looking at you're looking down the pipe of a radio wave. Right? If zero is in the middle, the first thing that it, that it changes is the phase. It changes it at a 45 degree angle, at a 90 degree angle, at a 180 degree angle. It changes the phase. So it's going to send bits and bytes across one phase, but it's also going to send bits and bytes in your distance, your amplitude, from zero out. This one's really difficult to understand. It's taking me forever to try and understand quantum. But basically what it does is it's a way to put more data uh, onto the same pipe. And the way that I like to explain it is, do you know any Puerto Ricans? <laughs> yes. Have you ever spoke, have, have you ever heard a uh, Puerto Rican speak Spanish? Okay. In a three second time frame, <laughs> a Mexican can say the quick brown, five, no, can, the quick, you know what I mean? A Puerto Rican can read you a book in that same amount of time. They get a lot more in there. Their modulation is different. They're speaking a different language and they're condensing a lot more. They're modulating that, that conversation differently. So they're packing more data into that same amount of time. It's the easiest way to explain modulation. Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, that's it. Ay, coño. So, so different types of modulation. You've got QPSK, which is giving you one, two, three, four different types of phase that's coming across. And each one of these, referred to as symbols, each one of these symbols gives you two bits. It's pretty cool, right? Two bits per hertz using that type of modulation. Uh, quantitative phase shift keying, 
I think that's what it's called, something phase shift key. Anyway, so what, what it does is that all it's doing is it's varying. This one's at this, this angle, this one's at this angle, this one's at this angle, this one's at this angle. And so that's how it, it modulates it. So you got two bits, two bits, two bits, two bits, right? 16 POM gives you four different quadrants with four different modulation uh, angles or, or phases in each one of them. Does that make sense? So four times four is 16. This gives you four bits on each one of these, which is pretty cool. Well, four bits per, per quad, right? So one, two, three, four, total of 16 on there. So QPSK, very basic, right? 16 QAM is over there. Then you start to look at 64 QAM, and then you start to look at 256 QAM. And so what it's doing is it's taking a bit of data from every angle and every distance. That's one, that's another, that's another, that's another. That's another, that's another, that's another. And so it's fascinating stuff, man. This is, how, this is what they do in fiber optics. This is how you get such high throughput in fiber optics is they're passing 1024 QAM and 2048 QAM. Imagine what that looks like, right? That's 64 and that's 256. Imagine what 2048 QAM looks like. So they pass all this data across these pipes. And that's how you get this high level of, of capacity because now you're, you're not only changing the amplitude, but you're changing the phase and you're sticking bytes on it here and you're rotating it this way. This actually looks like a star when you look at it from the front. The way that it gets it, it does this kind of pattern and it looks like a star. That's why when you asked about a star configuration, that's, it actually ends up looking like that. So QAM is, is, is where everyone is, QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. Now, this, this is a lot of crap. This is a, these are lots of bits and lots of bytes. What happens if you knock out this part? You lose data, you lose packets, you lose the ability to communicate. Because since you can only get a little bit of it, now, you know, if, if this part's messed up, now you're only getting a little bit of that data through. And so this is where we start to talk about interference. And this is start where we start to talk about why a good signal makes sense and why a good signal is strong. Man, I'm trying to burn as much time as I can. I apologize. <laughs> so let's talk about signal strength. When I look at this, right, I see if this represents, if every single one of these yellow dots is a piece of data, is one, let's say it's one bit or one byte, let's just say it's one byte of data, and you're trying to process all of these, and you have a crappy signal, and it can't pass this whole quadrant, you're not going to get the data that you want. So you have to look about signal strength. Unfortunately, everyone has been tuned to judge their signal strength based on what? On the number of bars on their damn phone. That's it. How many bars do you have? That's it. It's a good signal because you have lots of bars. It's a bad signal because you don't have lots of bars. That doesn't do anything to tell you about the quality of the signal. All it does is show you what the strength of that signal is. So I might be able to hear you really, really well. My wife mumbles, right? I love my wife to death. She mumbles. So she could be talking to me at a perfectly normal volume, but mumbling. So I could hear her three bars worth. But she's mumbling. I don't know what the hell she's saying. You know what I mean? And I'm pretty sure I do it too. I'm probably the one who taught her, right? So you might be able to hear me. Shit, you can hear me great. You have no idea what I just said. Great signal strength, terrible signal quality. Does that make sense? So everyone's like, oh, bro, I got bars. Man, come on. Anyway, so the trick is to listen. The trick is to listen better. The trick is how do you get devices that, that listen better, that understand, that can take those mumbles and convert them into, into data, right? You got to hear real good. That's the trick. Um, in Wi-Fi, one of the, one of, something that I use all the time, and this is, this is probably one of the most important things if, if you don't listen, if you don't remember anything else, this is the, the one thing that, man, I try and drive home with everyone. And that is, I have a friend, Tracy. I talk about my friend Tracy all the time. I love her to death. She's like my sister. She's so loud that when you walk up to a party, you know that Tracy's there. You walk up and in the front of the house, you hear her laughing in the backyard. She's having a great time. You're like, Tracy's here. You know she's there. Now, what's interesting about that is that let's take the, let's, let's talk about bars, right? If, I, if Tracy's a transmitter, she's an access point, right? And I'm a, I'm a phone, I'm a receiver, and I'm standing in front of the house. I can hear Tracy laughing, I can hear her talking, I can hear her yelling. I've got four bars worth of Tracy in the front yard. If I'm 
Imagine you're at the front, the front door of a house and there's a party going on in the background and you can hear one person laughing and you talk back to them in a normal tone of voice. You go, hey, I'm here. Can you guys come open up the front door? Are they going to hear you? No, they're not going to hear you because you are a very low transmitter. You're not transmitting at a power or signal level loud enough for them to hear you in the backyard. And so what can you do? You can turn up. You can scream as loud as you can. But even at that, they probably can't hear you, right? They're a very loud transmitter. You're a very weak transmitter. That's why the stupidest question in Wi-Fi is how far does your Wi-Fi go? That's the dumbest question you can ever ask. And you've, everyone's probably asked it. That is the absolute worst question you can ask a wireless person. Well, how far does your Wi-Fi go? How, how far does your car go? You put enough gas in it, it can go as far as you want it to go. I don't know, how long do you want to drive it? It's a, it's a bad question. It's not an accurate question. How far does your Wi-Fi go? No, 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 no. How well can I hear you? That's the right question to ask. Because this device and that device are completely different. There's a device that's hanging up there on the ceiling that I can hear from across the street. That access point at 2.4 gigahertz with a big old long four-inch signal, long four-inch signal, with a big long four-inch signal shooting across, you know, at a, at a power rate that's nice and long. I can hear that signal from across the street from someone else's house. But if this guy's trying to talk back, it's like me trying to get Tracy's attention from the backyard. She's loud. Ah! And I can hear her fine, but I can't talk back to her. She's not going to hear me. And so what's happened is now that everyone has one of these in their pockets, you know, laptops, super strong transmitters in here. 80 milliwatt, 100 milliwatt, 150 milliwatt, nice strong transmitters. You can take this a pretty significant distance away from an access point and it can communicate back. But this guy, not so much. 200 feet, 300 feet maybe. Maybe on a, on a good day with nothing in between here and there. And so that's part of the issue. So next time someone goes, hey, how far does your Wi-Fi, how far, you know, how far does it reach? It's not about that. It's about how far your device can communicate back to it. Go ahead. Does that make sense to you guys? And you never think about it until I say it, and you're like, oh, shit, yeah, right? Oh. Hey, that rating that you say, like, because I've seen it before, like, on some, um, like, video transmitters for, like, FPV, um, like, how far does it go? It'll be, like, 250 milliwatts or 500 milliwatts, mm -hmm. is that like the amount of power going into the antenna or is that the amount of power that's going to what? Or that's the, okay, so I didn't talk about DBM and DBI at all in this. And what that is, is that's the amount, that's the, that's the volume, right? If I'm talking to you, let's say right now I'm talking to you at 10 and now 20 and 30 and 40, that's, that's my volume, that's my power rating, right? The antenna is if I'm holding a, uh, a megaphone in front of me, and that megaphone, magnif not magnifies, but it amplifies, <laughs> we can't think, it amplifies that signal. That megaphone is acting as an antenna. I'm a transmitter operate, you know, transmitting a certain power, but that antenna is what allows it to go further in a direction louder. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah so, so the higher it goes, the, the deal with it is that the FCC stipulates that you can only, in unlicensed frequencies, you can only operate at a maximum of 30 dB or one watt max. So if you have a 250 milliwatt transmitter, then the antenna that you put on there, if it's a 15 dBi or 17 dBi, you have to do a conversion between dBi and milliwatts to determine what the maximum size antenna you can put on your transmitter. And no one does that. Everyone takes the radios and they turn it up to one watt and they put a 30 dBm antenna on there, which is another watt. Now, effect, it's called EIRP, Effective Isotropic Radiation Pattern. Uh, power. Effective Isotropic Radiated Power. Jesus, how do I remember this crap? Anyway, so EIRP, you can only have a maximum of 1 watt EIRP or 30 dBm EIRP. So if you're broadcasting at 20, 250 milliwatt, that's like 20, 22, I think it's like 22 dB, which means you can only put an 8 dBi antenna on there. But no one ever pays attention to that. They go out there and they put up. Yeah, dude. And so, so, I mean, we'll talk about interference in a second. I mean, well, here's, here's where we talk about interference. And, and signal noise. And, and I'll catch back on that real quick because this, this, this is another absolutely imperative part about radio communication. So I kind of, you see where I'm going, I kind of want to give you guys a little bit of a primer on how all this crap works. And now let's talk about, you know, in the real world, some numbers and, and things that you may have seen. And so let's talk about SNR because when I talk about being able to hear you versus being able to communicate with you, right? How many times have you heard that from your wife? You're hearing me, but we're not communicating. Anyway. Um, that's, that's where this comes in. And so signal to noise ratio is super easy to understand. All right? SNR is how... 
The Growing Danger of Human Trafficking, tonight at 10. Okay, so, so what this does is this gives you the ability to, to communicate. So here's how we're going to define SNR. Eric is sitting in the back corner over there, right? Check this out. This is a perfect way to, to define it. Hey, Eric, can you hear me? You can hear me, no problem. Cool, say something back. Okay, so I can hear you just fine. Okay, on the count of three, I want everybody to turn to your side and say your first name to your neighbor as loud as you can three times. Ready? One, two, three. Hey, Eric, how's it going? Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Okay, do you think Eric could hear me? No, because all you guys were talking and shouting your name like a bunch of idiots. <laughs> but that, so here's, here's what we have. I'm talking to Eric, and this is my signal. That's a clear signal. You guys are talking to each other, and that's the noise. Are you freaking my computer? Yeah, so the SNR ratio is what that signal is on top of what the noise is. So in order for Eric to hear me, I have to speak at a volume that's not only high enough for him to hear me, but loud enough for him to understand. Does that make sense? SNR. SNR is the single most important thing in radio communications. Are there like computer algorithms that can clean up noise? And that way yes. Yeah, there's uh, interference rejection. There's all kinds of weird stuff that, that they do. Can you use like noise gates and stuff like you do in studios? And yes. Yep. 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 Use noise gates, use block pass fil band pass filters, use all kinds of different tricks and stuff to get there. So, but here's the basic understanding is SNR is how, how much of your signal is above your noise floor, right? And so a good SNR reading is about 20. It's about 20 dB from the top of the noise floor to the bottom part of your signal. So if you look at about a 20 SNR, that's going to give you a nice, big, open channel to communicate with. So let's go back and think about a highway, right? In 2.4 gigahertz, you have from 2400 megahertz to 2450 megahertz, or 2460 megahertz. You have 60 megahertz, right? And let's say each lane is, is 20 megahertz wide. You only have th room for three trucks on there, right? Because there's only three 20 megahertz non-overlapping channels. But in order for the trucks to be able to drive down that road, let's say the road is covered in gravel, right? If the road is covered in gravel, and that, that representing the noise floor is really high, you're not going to be able to drive your truck down that road as quickly as possible, are you? But as that noise floor drops, and as it gets lower, and as that, that delta between the two gets much wider, now your truck can sail down the highway as fast as it can. Does that make sense? So now what you have is you, you have a, 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 an area that the signal, there, or that the noise level is super high, and you're trying to communicate at the same time. It's like driving your truck through gravel. And so when you think about it, if there was an access point in, that, in this room, and in that room, and in that room, and over there, and downstairs, every different wireless device contributes to what's referred to as the noise floor. The noise floor is you guys saying your names to each other. That's the noise floor. So if you two guys are the only ones saying your name, I can still hear Eric back and forth because that noise floor is low. But as more people, more transmitters, in this room, start transmitting and receiving, that raises the overall noise floor. Does that make sense? Okay, so when you have, this is, I'm, I'm doing a talk on this specific deal at the Region 1 Technology Show in education because Cisco told everyone it was a great idea to install one access point in every single classroom on a campus. Why is that bad? They're all interrupting each other. Now you have all these access points that are trying to talk to you and me at the same time, imagine if those, if, imagine if it was a noise, right? And you walk into a school and you can hear every one of those access points talking at the same time. They're doing it because they say, well, you know, you only want 30 students on each access point, right? So you want one access point here and one access point here and here and here. But now what you've done is you've raised the overall effective noise floor. And then you get what happened three years ago in the city, or five years ago in the city of McAllen. We gave everyone iPads and their Wi-Fi didn't work. It didn't work because you had so many damn access points trying to communicate with each other that they were having a hard enough time trying to figure out who was an access point and who was a client that they couldn't get the clients to connect to the access points. This happens in, in, in education and in K-12 and higher education all the time because everyone thinks the solution is to throw more access points at it. All that does is raise your noise floor. All it does is increase the amount of gravel on the highway that you're trying to drive a big-ass truck through Meanwhile, 300 other people are trying to drive a truck that's just the same size down that highway. 
Make sense? Is that because vendors are greedy? Or That's because vendors want to make money. And, and it, it makes sense. They go, well, you can only put 30 users on there, so you're going to need one every classroom. And, and IT people who don't know better go, all right, fucking sounds like a deal. Go ahead, Cisco. You, you have to be right. You can't be wrong. You're Cisco. So what this comes down to, again, to go back to, to what we're talking about, is it's not hearing louder, it's hearing better. And so in, in this equation, what happens when there's an interfere? What happens when that noise floor is, is higher? And I can only drive my truck, you know, down, down one lane, because only one lane is not covered in that gravel. You know, if you're running a very low modulation, it's, it's easier to get your data across, because you have less to lose. Does that make sense? If there's high interference in this area, you're only sending four of these little dots across. But in that same situation, if it's the same amount of interference and you're trying to send all of these, you're going to get a lot more packet loss than you do at a lower modulation. So what happens on Wi-Fi radios is they have a step down. They'll start trying to talk and transmit at 256 qualm, and if they can't communicate well at 256, they back down to 64, then down to 16, then down to 8, then down to QPSK. So their data rate gets slower because they're trying to modulate differently so that that communication can actually take place reliably as opposed to just establishing the link. It's crazy. Now you're going to look at a little signal bar in the corner of your laptop and be like, holy shit, that's crazy. So what affects a radio signal? I'm running sh super short on time. So what affects a radio signal? Right? This is pretty cool. So 88FM, one of my favorite stations, make sure you give to your local NPR affiliate. 88 FM is much lower on the spectrum, 88 megahertz versus Wi-Fi way up here at 5.8 gigahertz. Because rest assured, everything's moving to 5 gig. Your two 4 devices aren't going to be, I mean, they'll still work at your home. But even the top technology trade shows like Interop, for the last two years, the largest technology trade show for networking equipment does not support 2.4 gigahertz on their trade show floor. It's 5 gig only. Everyone's moving to 5 gig only. So you're going to, the two 4 device, it the next couple of access points and routers and whatnot that you buy at home are slowly going to start to transition you over to 5 gig. So how does this, how is that effective and, and what affects that signal? So down here at 88, 88 FM, right, 88 megahertz, let's see, if, if 5 gig was 2 inches and 2 gig was 5 inches, then 1 gig is probably going to be like math, I don't know, <laughs> some shit, like 8 or Fuck, I don't know, like seven We're recording. I'm gonna <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I forget you're here sometimes. Earmuffs. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, you go from two to four to, to say six or seven inches or, or eight inches on that signal. What's fascinating about that is different things attenuate the signal in different ways, depending on the frequency and depending on the, uh, what they're made of. Glass, for example, we have no problem seeing Renee out there drinking a beer. Right, everyone start waving with the wave at range, just wave at <laughs> To creepers, right? So we have no problem seeing Renee, right? If these windows were a little bit opaque or if they were made out of, I don't know, iron, we wouldn't be able to see him because our our vision would be impaired. Our the way that we the way that our eyes are able to, to see the light reflected off them would be impaired. That's the same way that radio signals are affected. Dependent upon the building material, they attenuate the signal in different ways. Attenuate meaning take away from. If it's supposed to be transmitting at 100% and this takes away 20, 80, right? Simple. That's not even a real number, but it's cool. It, it gets a point across. So if this takes away 12 dB or 10 dB or 6 dB, that's going to attenuate the signal a certain amount. Modulation is dependent upon uh, signal strength. You have to have a good, clean signal. Good, strong, clean signal. If your signal quality sucks, you're not going to be able to hit high modulation. If you don't hit high modulation, you can't get good throughput, right? This is what we've learned so far. So in order to get a good signal, you have to have as few attenuators as possible. You have to have as few walls, as few windows, because they take away, they degrade that signal. And they degrade the signal at different strengths based on frequency. So if you put a big wooden door down here close to, to 88 FM, like in your house or in your car, it doesn't affect the signal. You can still hear the radio pretty well. You can listen to, you know, Conjunto Sundays, and you don't have an issue with it because that signal is this, you know, big agent signal flipping through and coming through your wall. It's not being attenuated. However, if you slide that door over to the right, check this out. Look how many, how many times does a bump go through that wall? Just once. I think it's, you know, four-inch wall, right? 
an 8 inch signal, it's only going to hit it once. So you're going to lose very little data because it only, it only is going to affect one of those. But over here in 5 gig, look at that. This isn't realistic, you know, this isn't to scale, but it gets the point across. At 5 gig and a 2 gig, that attenuator means a lot more. It degrades your signal level a lot more as you go up in frequency. So from a 2 gig signal to a 5 gig signal, that same attenuator is going to affect it. That's why in my house I've got an access point that's in the exact same place that my 2 gig access point was in, but now it doesn't work as well. It doesn't go as far because there's more attenuators in there, and 2.4 dealt with them a little bit better. Uh, why does AFM have kind of a sound in the background? Uh, Analog signals. But, but in the background in Edinburgh, I don't know, maybe it's a place better in the calendar. Terrible towers. Transmitters. It's all about transmit, transmit power, and receive power. And those are the, the key fundamentals here. And so yeah, it's a. Stations do not have it. They might be transmitting louder. Their towers might be closer to you. How come I get such a good Wi Fi signal in my bathroom, but not right next to the router? Right. <laughs> <laughs> the umbrella effect. Because of multi path, sir, it bounces underneath that little crack in the door. Everyone gets good Wi Fi in their bathroom. I want to know what the statistic is of how many. Like, how much time people spend on wireless devices inside the can? Because it's got to be huge, man. It's got to be huge. Can you, can you get interference from large uh, machines running in your house, like a dishwasher or a washing machine? No. Well, if you have faulty wiring, yeah. Because it, what it'll do is it'll create electromagnetic signal or frequencies that can interfere with it. So does that make sense? Right there? It, it's affected differently depending upon frequency. Also depending upon building material. This... A wall is only, you know, these glass windows are going to give you about 6 dB. Um, this, you know, uh, drywall gives you about 8 dB. Uh, cinder block wall gives you about 12 dB. And you have to, sub it's what's called a link budget. You have to subtract that from what you're trying to get. So if I'm transmitting, right, we talked about EIRP. If I'm transmitting at 30, right, remember we talked about that maximum FCC will allow you. And, and I'm sitting here, and in order to get a certain amount of modulation, I need to be at a certain signal level. So let's say I need to be at 40. Or let's say I need to be at 20. I'm transmitting at 30, minus 6 for the window, right? And then free space loss, which is a whole different concept. Let's say that's another 2. Now let's say it's a total of 8. My link budget is going to allow me to hit that modulation type because it's 30 minus 8 gives me 22. And if I need to be at 20 and I'm at 22, then I can hit that modulation rate. It's a very coarse way to explain it, but that's kind of the concept. If you have an access point and you're trying to get a specific data rate and you've got walls in the way, those walls will affect your signal and not allow you to get the, the receive level that you need in order to attain the modulation rate that you need. So we use software. Nerds like me pay expensive, uh, pay a lot of money for software, so we don't have to sit there and calculate all of it. And what it does is you define what that wall is, what it's made of, how tall it is, what building material it is, where you're going to put your access point, all the characteristics of your access point, what type of transmitter, how strong, what type of antenna, who the manufacturer is, and you drop it down on top of a, of a map, and you hit a button, and it renders it, and it shows you what your signal strength is going to look like. I don't know if you guys are Redditors, but did you see this thing on Reddit? This is pretty boss, man. <laughs> so this computer science teacher came up with a way to define what Wi-Fi signals look like in his apartment, and he mapped them out, and so this is what it looks like on his transmitter. Which is pretty interesting, and you can see. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> so, uh, oh, right there. Oh, um, so, but it's interesting. You can see the way that the walls attenuate the signal, and how they bounce around, and how it moves. It's pretty fascinating it stuff. Have anything in the bathroom, though. Yeah. Right. Well, what are you gonna do? Maybe those bathroom walls are made out of steel. Anyway, so here is the paragraph that you never would have known that you would understand two hours ago. The stronger the signal, the better the chance for higher SNR. The higher the SNR, the better the modulation. The better the modulation, the higher data rate. Did we learn something or what? That's boss, right? Woo, I'm like a teacher. Now let's talk about Wi-Fi. <laughs> so what did I show you guys at the very beginning? How, how all this comes back to, to kind of what we talked about. Let's walk through the way that Wi-Fi works. This is very quick. These are like the last six slides, and, then, and I totally appreciate you guys staying and listening to me. Uh, I love talking about this stuff. Um, so here's how it works. Your phone or your device sends out what's called a probe request. The very first thing it does is it sends out a, a message from your device and it says, hey, are there any access points out there? And then what it does directly after that is it takes a list of all the access points that you've connected to 
in the lifetime of your phone that you haven't hit the forget this network for. And it says, hey, are there any access points out there? You know, like Starbucks or Hilton Honors or, you know, South Padre Island Wi-Fi or, you know, Roosevelt or wherever it is. And it sends out this list. And so the access point then responds and it says, hey, I'm SSID Drew. SSID is Service Set Identifier. That's the network name. That's what you see when you bring it up. That's your SSID. And so it says, hey, my SSID is Drew. And I'm not in your list, but this is who I am. And it says, cool, SSID Drew. It's nice to meet you. I'm totally authorized to communicate with you. Here's my credential. Here's my password. Here's my certificate. Here's whatever's necessary in order to communicate. And it checks that password or it checks that credential on the back end. And it turns around and it says, cool, you're good to go. Okay, iPhone, your key works. You know, now let's set you up. And it says, okay, I'm going to ask you if I can be associated with your access point. Connect me. And it turns around and says, okay, man, you're connected. And then it gives you an, it gives you a, 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 an IP address and then you're good to go. And that's the whole way that this thing works. It's very simple. It says, hey, access point, this guy responds. This guy sees the response. This guy says, cool, you're authorized. This guy says, I want to connect. And it says, cool, you're connected. So aside from all the other RF stuff, the way that I tricked your devices into thinking that I was someone that I wasn't is I interrupted that first part. It said, hey, are there any access points out there? Starbucks, Linksys, code RGB, Wi-Fi. I responded with a yes. Are there any access points out there? Yes. Is code RGB here? Sure. Why not? You know, yeah, I'm, you know, whatever. And it turns around and says, oh, okay, cool. Because these devices are idiots. And it says, yeah, oh, okay, you're who you are. I must be good to go. And that's what allowed me very, very simply to trick your phone into thinking that I was someone that I was not. Because it had a good signal strength because I was closer. I was here. I was sitting right here as opposed to the access point out there. And your phone already knows which networks to look for. It knows to look for Hilton or AT&T or whatever. I just said that I was them, and your phone thought that that's who it was, and it was like, cool, must be legit, we're good to go. You know, where's my free candy, Mr. Band Driver? Let's have a great time. And so it's weird. That's how that, that whole thing works, and I tricked your phones into doing that very briefly because that's a great way to get people's attention. <laughs> um, but it also shows that on the network side, all this stuff that we just talked about is only secure if you make it secure. If you want to connect to a secure network, connect to that secure network. Don't ever connect to an unsecured network. If you're at a coffee shop, there's this really cool little feature on your iPhone when you connect to a wireless network and you're ready to get off it right here. You hit forget this network and you hit okay, forget and it's gone. It's wiped off your phone. It's kind of a pain in the ass to do it. But if you do that, then you'll never be subjected to this attack. But if you don't do that, and you happen to walk by my booth or whatever, and I'm trying to show this stuff off, then that's how I do it. So that's how I got the... the so you exploited any unsecured SSID we connected to? Unsecured SSIDs? Yeah, it rebeacons. What it does is it, it grabs your list of SSIDs that you're looking for, and it rebroadcasts that out to everyone in the hopes that I can fish and pull in. Like if you've been to you know, AT&T or, or if you've been to you know, Hilton or the airport, and you broadcast that, maybe you have also... And it grabs, it says, oh, yeah, so I'm all these people. And it gives you the ability to connect. That's why, like some of you guys, when you turned your phone on, it, it just magically connected. That's how it did it. Because it said, oh, you are who you say you are, or not. Anyway, so that's kind of, that's the basic. And now you know annoying is half the battle. And the other half is red and blue lasers. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of a, a, an intro to the stuff, uh, to RF. Now, if you guys ever have any questions or you want to know more, dig deeper, let me know. I totally enjoy talking about this. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, but mostly I, I appreciate your time. I know some of it was like, holy crap, you know, it was weird. But it's important. It's, it's fun to understand because now you get a better understanding of how it works overall. So the next time you're holding your hand on top of your phone and you realize that the antenna is right underneath your hand and your call drops every time you hold your phone like this, maybe you should try holding your phone like this and stop attenuating your signal. So you can get a higher modulation rate so you can complete that call. There you go. That's the end. Thanks, guys.